Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 26 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me as always is my co-host Pervez Ahmed. Thank you, Zaki. Welcome, uh, everyone. I imagine whether you're a student or you're a parent, you have this is right around school restarting. Yeah, well, my, my semester's starting uh, next week, and I'm already, I gotta be honest, I'm feeling really, really tired. I'm trying to find a way to keep up keep awake i got all these papers to grade already already in advance uh I'm not teaching. to mention what you've got now three in school i've got three in school i'm teaching nine classes when, when i um, say three in school i mean three kids three children three out of your yes. four yeah three out of the four yeah so my point is i need to stay up a lot to get a lot of work done so this this episode could not be happening at a better time that's true staying because, awake because we're, we're joined by uh, the perfect guest to help elucidate and illuminate uh, the the finer aspects of how to stay awake the right way. Uh, we're, I'm talking about coffee, of course. And joining us is Mukhtar al And uh, he grew up as a Yemeni American, but coffee was always part of his identity. His family has been growing coffee for at least nine generations. After studying and researching the specialty coffee market and the coffee sector in Yemen, Mukhtar founded Mocha Mill in 2014. Since then, he's completely immersed himself in the specialty coffee world, took it upon himself to become a specialty coffee sensory analyst. So I I need to talk to you, Mukhtar. Thank you so much for joining us, first of all. Pleasure to be here with you guys today. So, f- coffee. How does, how does one become a coffee aficionado? Explain this to me. There are many roads to get to that, to that but uh, you don't have to have a special certification or, you know, uh, a label. It just means that you love, you have a passion for coffee, and it's something that you can't live without. And um, that, that's me, then, that. by definition. Yeah. But to become a certified specialty coffee sensory analyst or coffee curator, it's a 22-point exam uh, you take, and it's uh, administered by the Coffee Quality Institute, it's this big umbrella coffee organization. And they work in most uh, coffee-growing countries. And... Uh, Part of these exams, one of them I had to take was I had to memorize 36 smells for coffee. Smells. Smells. Wow. I had to learn 16 visual defects, five organic acids found in coffee when drinking. You have to, it's quite an extensive uh, exam and there's a little less than 4,000 people in the world who have that certification. Wow. In short, what it is, it's sort of a language you learn to speak. And so anyone from Kenya or Ethiopia or, you know, England or U.S., who has this certification has calibrated their tongue based on 10 categories of taste and flavor and smell. And you cup or taste coffee and you have a score sheet, these 10 categories. And it's by increments of 0.25. So 6, 6.25, 6.50, 6.75, 7. It's very precise. Mm-hmm. And I used to be like, well, coffee is uh, it's very subjective, it's a taste. But if you learn to calibrate, <coughs> you can learn to assess the coffee and write down your information and share it with the world. So anybody who has that, has that certification will give, uh, will give the same score. And it's pretty amazing. It actually started here in San Francisco. There's a company called the Hills Brothers Coffee Company. Right. If you ever go in front of the Ferry Building, it's that red brick building. The Hills Brothers, they were the first to do vacuum packaging in the late 1800s and 1900s. And all the coffee that came out of the Panama Canal through from Colombia and Brazil came to San Francisco, in the port of SF, and they needed to do find a way to do qualitative analysis. Okay. So they decided to come up with the science of coffee tasting. And if you go to there, the address I believe is 55 Harrison Street. Mm-hmm. The building now is owned by Google and Mozilla Firefox and the Warren School of Business. But if you go down there in their courtyard, you'll see a statue of an Arab man, Muslim man drinking coffee. And that used to be their logo. Wow. And who is it just a nondescript Arab man or is it meant to be someone? It's in a collage of Orientalism. It has like Moroccan <laughs> sandals and right. it's an Indian Mughal like dress and an Arab ah. turban and and they called it an Ethiopian man, I think the, the Greek um uh, designer originally, but it's a it's a Muslim Arab man. Wow. Yemen is the only Arab country that grows coffee commercially, so it's a Yemeni man in particular. Got it. It was a time when Muslims were looked at as cool people, not terrorists. The exotic. Yeah, and right. exotic, you know, Arabian, finest right. coffee in the world. <clears throat> it used to be a big old giant um, billboard right from the Bay Bridge. 
and when they would roast their coffee there, you could smell it across the Bay Bridge. That's how wow. powerful it was. But wow. Wow. so it's like it's very interesting uh, when, we, when we look at coffee and this uh, and how it, how you know growing up in the Bay Area, it's a part of our you know geology. Right, right. So speaking about growing up in the Bay Area, so you were you, you were born in Yemen, is that correct? And you came here as a young uh, young child. I was born in uh, in Liverpool, England. Oh, sorry. Out of, okay. Out of all places. <laughs> <laughs> but um hey, I, the Beatles uh, they, the they, Beatles, they gave us the Beatles right John Lennon Airport right and uh <laughs> I was there for a few months and <laughs> okay. I grew up early on in Brooklyn New York and I came here when I was about 10 years old to California to San Francisco wow and my family's from Yemen my both my parents are from Yemen and um I would go to Yemen periodically I went there after high school middle school for almost two years oh and um I went back after high school for a year and so it's kind of it's back and forth between Yemen and the U.S. Got in my uh, adolescent years. Right, right. And then uh, in terms of college, you, you, uh, you're in San Francisco. Okay. And, you know, in the middle of my college career is when I took this detour into coffee. And I've been on the journey since. Interesting. Wow. So tell us a little bit about that journey then, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. In yeah. coffee, especially coffee, they say we have three major waves. The, the first wave coming out of Yemen, Mocha, in the 1400s. And then the second wave... In the 50s and 60s, instant coffees that were coming around. Folgers coffee is one of the examples. And now there's this new third wave, uh, especially coffee. And so I grew up in this kind of third wave of coffee. Right. Although I don't like to call it the third wave. Um, I was speaking to James Freeman, fa CEO and founder of Blue Bottle in Tokyo in June. And he said something very interesting. He said in Cairo, Egypt, in the 1500s, there were over 3,000 coffee houses that were serving single origin Yemeni coffee. He said, what way was that? Right. And so... When was this, sorry? In the 1500s. 1500s, and okay. And so, yeah, Muslims, we have a deep tradition and heritage in coffee. So you're the man to talk to about that. So I, I, I you know, not only for, I mean, the benefit of our listeners, but I think my own benefit uh, as someone who enjoys coffee. Pervez is know quite the aficionado. <laughs> right, although I, I wish I could say the same about in terms of knowing the sort of history uh, of coffee and well, its relationship to the Muslim world. Th yeah. That's that's very interesting because I think that uh, for many people listening to this podcast, what what you're with the knowledge you're dropping right now, will that'll be the first time yeah. they've ever even made that that linkage between uh, coffee and and uh, you know uh, Muslims. That's, Correct. That, like uh, nobody thinks about. It's almost instinctively. I mean, if I can be a little biographical, I mean, when you hear the word coffee, you think maybe Colombia. That's as far as that's that, that's as exotic as you get. If not, you you, you think maybe you automatically think Starbucks, Starbucks is, yeah. worse. Yeah, I was I was trying to present a best case scenario. You think Colombia? So so tell us a little bit about how maybe some of that is a little misinformed. Let's uh, let's begin uh, at the beginning. There you go. <laughs> the it's a good place to start. <laughs> so got the word coffee and entomology <laughs> where it comes from. The word coffee is short for qahwat al bun. And so, qahwat al bun, the word qahwa in Arabic, uh, uh, literally, literally means, it means al khamr al yuthiru nashwa. It means the invigorating wine that raises you to a state of ecstasy. That's the wow. literal translation of the word coffee. Uh -huh, yeah. And the other word is qaha, it's a root word which means it satiates you or makes you not hungry, which mm -hmm. coffee does. That's right. And so, it, it could be translated as the wine of the bean. So qahwa means coffee, wine, and bean is bunna. The same word in Amharic actually too, they use the same word bunna in Ethiopia. So there is a difference of opinion where coffee starts. Okay. Does it start in Yemen or does it start in Ethiopia? I'm probably the only Yemeni who will say that it originated in Ethiopia. <laughs> <laughs> and I look at things both historically and scientifically. Mm -hmm. So looking at coffee genetics and the varietals in the world, in the world, there are about 30 or so varietals of coffee. We hear the Tipica, the Bourbon, which is the two major branches. You have two species of coffee okay. that are known. Arabica, and the Arabs, yes. and Robusta. Robusta is low elevation. Arabica is higher elevation. Especially coffees tend to always be Arabica coffees. Okay. The higher coffee is grown, the slower it matures, the more sugars and, and complexity it has. Hmm. Low elevation coffee, like a Robusta, has more caffeine. Caffeine, what it is, is actually a self-defense mechanism for the plant. So there's always more life in low elevations, more insects, more bacteria, more fungus. So mm. when the insects eat this 
or fungus eats this uh, caffeine, this, this chemical that's in the coffee tree, it dies. It's too strong for it. And so when you go up to high elevations, there's less life. It's colder, difficult to live. So it doesn't need as much. Yeah, it's not so, as caffeinated. So, so Robusta low end co- lowland coffees have double the caffeine, half the sugar. And higher going coffee, Arabica, they have half the, the, the caffeine, but double the sugar, which is why high elevations are always you know, looked at as something exotic and hard to get to. Mm. And so... So coffee has natural sugars that are part yes, of it? Yes, it does. I didn't know that. Uh, it's, as it ripens, it starts as a, essentially a terry with two pit, with a pit in it. Two pits with two beans. And so the coffee is actually a shrub. And it's a fruit that bears out of this. And when it starts off its journey, it's, it, takes, uh, it takes nine months for the coffee bean to mature. Wow. And it starts off green, and as it ripens, it becomes yellow. Then when it's fully ripe, it's red and has a high sugar content. Um, which we'll get to later, why it's, why it's important to know that. And so there's the varietals. In Panama, you have the Geisha varietal, you have the Katura, Katoy in Brazil, and, the, and all these different varietals of coffee around the world. In Yemen, there are several dozen varietals of unknown coffees that people just don't know about. It's hard to get to, maybe a, uh, close to 100 even. In Ethiopia, the government has over 6,500 varietals that have been documented and cataloged, and hundreds if not thousands of unknown varietals. So we see that the birthplace of coffee, the plant itself, it has to come from Ethiopia based on that. Mm. Um, and um, and so the first though, to actually cultivate it intentionally and to harvest it and to process it and drink it as a brew, right. were Yemenis, were Sufi monks across the Red Sea in the port city of Mocha. Mocha, most people who hear the word mocha, it's some kind of chocolate drink. That's it's right. actually a city, a city, uh-huh. and it's a city that changed the world. Uh, it's the first place to commercialize coffee production and current. And this is a port city in Yemen. In Yemen. Okay. And so the Sufi monks who lived in in Mocha, one monk in particular, his name was Sheikh Ali ibn Umar al Qurashi al Shadli. He was from the city of Tarim in Hadramaut. Right. He was he moved to to Mocha and he had followers there. And what happened was. At night times, when he would be preaching to to locals and inhabitants, they were day laborers. They were they were farmers and day laborers, so they were very you know tired, and they wanted to do some kind of drink to keep people awake, and so they knew about this. There was a plant in Ethiopia that people would chew on the berries and and get caffeinated from. Right. They would chew with some animal fat, and he had married an Ethiopian woman from Harar. East, Got it. I was east, wondering where the Ethiopian East Ethiopia. connection came. Okay. And in particular, Harar is a very, it's a very spiritual uh, city. It's the, 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 the strongest Muslim um, city in Ethiopia. And it was founded by my Sufi monks. Even till today, they still recite the um, connotations of Imam Haddad, Book of Assistance, and Sufi um, saints. What time period are we talking about right this now? 800 years ago. This is when okay. it first started in, uh, in Harar. And this particular sheikh was uh, in the 1450s. In this Mocha. particular sheikh was 1450s, okay. And he yeah. wrote the, f- uh, the first um, book on coffee. Mm. And one of his students wrote another book on coffee. His name was Abu Bakr Aydarus. He has, a, he has a mosque and sanctuary in Aden. And his book, it was called Inas al-Safwa Bian Fas al-Qahwa. The people of self-purification through the breaths of coffee. Mm-hmm. And his his teacher, Sheikh Ali ibn Umar al-Shadri, I actually had an, I have an article I bought on eBay from 1836, a newspaper article from England that talks about the city of Mocha and mentions Sheikh Ali ibn al mm-hmm. in great detail. And the story goes that travelers from Europe, it was primarily either from Portugal or Holland, mm-hmm. they stopped by, they were going on the route to Surat in Gujarat, India. It was a very important port. On the way, they stopped by the port of Mocha. One of the, the uh, sailors was sick, and the local sheikh, <coughs> Sheikh Ali, invited them over. Uh, Arabs and Muslims have a, a tendency to be very uh, good hosts and show generosity to them. Hospitable, too. right. And so he gave him this strange brew, and he drank it, and it right away felt good, great. And so from then on, they say the story of coffee began. He has an incredible book also, and he talks, he has these lines of poetry that say, I'll recite, I'll recite in Arabic and then I'll translate. Please. قهوة البني يا أهل الغرامي ساعدتني على طرد المنامي وعانتني بعون الله على طاعة الله والناس نيامي لا تلوموني على شربي لها إنها شراب السالة الكرامي. He says what could be translated as O coffee, or story of lovers. Mm-hmm. You helped me repel my sleep. 
You helped me stay away, awake and worship my Lord while people fell asleep. Don't blame me for my intense love for coffee. It is the drink of the righteous people. That's right. And so Beautiful. it's like there's an incredible spiritual aspect of coffee that people don't know or associate with. That's yeah. what it was used for. Right. It was used for to be alert and conscious and be able to stay up for night prayers. And and it was, uh, they call it the, the sustenance of the righteous people. Zad al-Salihin. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what they use it for initially. And at that time period, the Ottoman Turks, they uh, ruled through Yemen and, and controlled a part of Mocha along with the Yemeni Imams that ruled Yemen, the Saidi Imams. And if you sold a green seedling, a coffee seedling that could grow to a foreigner, you would be executed by Turkish or Yemeni authorities. Wow, why? So, because they, they didn't want it to be grown anywhere else in the world. Uh, they monopolized it. Right. And they would only sell boiled beans that were the, the embryo died inside so that no one can grow it. And they did this for a while. And there's different accounts, but one of the more accurate accounts say that in 1616, the Dutch sent a spy and from India. His name was Baba Badun Sufi. <laughs> and he took seven beans. He hit seven beans and he stole and he took them out of Yemen. He was able to smuggle them out. Mm -hmm. Eventually, they made, it made its way to one of the Dutch colonies in Indonesia on the island of Java. Ah. And that's where we get the name Java, Java from. from. So Java and Mocha became the first places and ports in the world where coffee was sold. Got it. So And so... Coffee has not been introduced to the Europeans yet. Oh, it was and in Mocha and Mocha in eighteen. Yeah, that, that, at that point, all coffee only came from Mocha. Got it. Oh, so they were importing. So, so, so Mocha was exporting coffee out. Yeah, it was they weren't allowing others to grow it. No, so even, they, they were the only game in town. Only right. game in town, and no one knew that across the Red Sea until we had all this coffee. That's right. Then they were getting it from Ethiopia. Or, or they, at or that point, the they had sea. already been growing it. Okay, got and, it. And um. It's interesting, the oldest area in Yemen to grow coffee and the oldest place in the world to actually cultivate coffee is in central Yemen, a place called, a province called Ib. And that's where my family's from. Hmm. So Now, is this is this lo low elevation or high elevation? Like, high elevation coffee. High elevation it's coffee. the first coffee to be cultivated and uh, shipped out. And so in Yemen, at that time, they have had a very sophisticated trade network. You know, even so coffee, the imams and Turkish authorities, it would be sent through different cities to be taxed first before it was able to come to the port. So the, the, the traders, in 1616, the Dutch opened the company, and then a year later, the French did, and then the, the East Tea India Company came from Britain, right. and they were never allowed to go into the interior to buy coffee directly from the farmers. They would have to be going through, it would be through certain cities. One city in particular was Beit al faqih This is along the trade route from Mocha, and that's where all the coffee in Yemen would come to, be taxed from their ship to Mocha to be sold. Beit al faqih is a city in Yemen? In Yemen. Okay. At that time, Mocha was an incredible city to behold. City of the jurists. This was a city where all, every, most countries had ambassadors. Or home of the jurists. Why, why did they call it Beit al There know? was a scholars oh, okay, that, that okay. lived there. Right, right. At that, Mocha had it was an incredible trade. Right. You know, humans interacted primarily in the, through war and through trade, and trade, of course, was a better way. <laughs> and so, people came to Mocha from all over. Mm. The Benian Indians, the Somali Buhras, the French, the Dutch, the English, all came to Mocha to trade. Right. Um, and before coffee entered Europe, the drink of choice was alcohol. Right. Water was very unclean. So Europe was in a drunken state for, many, for a long time. <laughs> we noticed that when coffee entered Europe, that the, in the coffee houses of, of London and Vienna and even the US and Russia, the American, French, and Russian revolutions all happened in coffee houses. The first battle boxes, the first newspapers, Mocha changed the world. The Industrial Revolution, we know that right now the, the second most traded commodity in the world after, co after oil is coffee. Wow. So it's like oil you know, runs machines and factories and coffee runs human beings. So today it's a huge commodity. And so the Dutch grew in, in Java. The sad part, I call it, you know, the dark side of coffee, don't sound too cliche, is that when coffee left Mocha, wherever it was grown, the people and locals were exploited and enslaved to grow for colonial powers. Mm -hmm. So in Indonesia, it was to the point where they weren't even allowed to drink coffee beans. The only coffee they could have, there was an the animal called the luwak. And you might have heard of this kopi luwak, this weird, strange coffee bean where this animal eats the berries and then defecates it That's out. Really and right. they sell it as the most expensive coffee in the world. Well, that was the only 
beans that the people of the, the locals were able to drink, allowed to drink. Mm-hmm. And then years later, someone was able to market that. Wait, they sell that now? Yeah, it's pooped it's, coffee. It's <laughs> the most expensive coffee in the world. It sounds repulsive. Um, I, I don't know what your um, what your what your uh, uh, index of, repul- of repulsiveness in your but well, poop one coffee of, is up there. Right? <laughs> one of my um, one of my coffee mentors, uh, Willem Boot, whose family comes from his long line of coffee um, uh, traders, and he is a great coffee consultant. He's a large, he's, ex- he's a, a huge uh, expert in coffee. He has a farm in, in Panama that produces one of the most expensive farms in the world, and he's my, I call him my coffee sheikh. Right, coffee right, I was gonna say, you actually went the same, you, you went the, the, the traditional he, route. He studied under the tutelage of a expert. I was I was fortunate enough yeah. to have him as a teacher, right. and when I asked him about this coffee, what he thought about it, this Kopi Luwak, he told me, and it's, it's, it's sad these animals go through a lot of these, they actually cage them and force feed them. Oh. He said that's coffee from assholes for assholes. Excuse my French. Oh, well, there we go. Um, <laughs> But nice, nice. <laughs> thank you for that one, Willow. Right, exactly. So we uh, we're in, in Java, and so from there, the Dutch had a peace treaty with the French, and they, as a symbolic gesture, they gave the French one coffee seed and one little plant. Mm-hmm. The, the French took that and they built the first greenhouse in the world for that coffee plant. Hmm. And and there's a man by the name of Gabriel de Clou. There's a different accounts of how he was able to get this, but he, the king of France gave him this coffee plant and his idea was to take it to the new world, quote unquote, and on the journey, their, their ship got lost at sea and they began to ration out their water supply and food supply. He gave up most of his water supply to his coffee plant that he had held in a glass, little glass uh, container. The people on the boat thought he was crazy. Well, they got to the island of Martinique in the Caribbean and from there they transported to Haiti at one point, Haiti was producing half of the world's coffee. Wow. Uh, when the people of Haiti fought up and won their liberation, uh, the French burned everything. And they took those plants, some of the plants, and they transported to Central and South America. Mm-hmm. And now Brazil produces almost a quarter, uh, a third actually, of the world's coffee from a plant that came from from, from Haiti. Haiti, that came from Martinique, from, from one seedland, they called the noble tree. That came from France, from, they're from Java, from Java seven beans that came from Yemen. Wow. And so this we call in science uh, bottleneck genetics. We have a place like Ethiopia, then Yemen with a bunch of varieties of coffee. And then you, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so what happens, it's an issue right now when there's a disease that affects one of the plants. Like we have rust right now, affecting mm-hmm. major um, coffee plantations and farms in Central and South America. It affects all the plants because there's not that much biodiversity, mm-hmm. which is one of the things that makes Yemeni coffee is very special. This diversity in varietals that aren't else in the world. Mm-hmm. And this is a you know a kind of a, a roadmap to understanding how coffee right. came out of Yemen and went through to um, to the world. That's right. Fascinating. Uh, this is something more in your in your wheelhouse, Zaki. Uh, when when you've been talking about how coffee is the second most traded commodity, which I I had no idea. Um, if they ever do a remake of Trading Places. Uh, it should be about coffee instead of uh, orange juice. There, you, well, I was I was thinking more like we could do like a Siri, we could do Syriana <laughs> about coffee. You know, <laughs> Syriana about coffee. That's a good, well, I mean, better analogy. I right? mean, this it's. Yeah. I think this is extraordinary. It I mean, is. I think I think the the depth of history in something that people, I mean, they do take it for granted, right? right. I mean, and and we take it for granted partially because you can't drive down the street without hitting a coffee joint usually one coffee joint every other block right so i mean it's it, when when we when we track the the trajectory of how we got to here from from the very humble roots for, of what you're describing I mean, that's extraordinary right so to talk talk a little if you will and then we'll come back to I, i'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, the like the muslim world as well but when does when when do when does the American, if you will, obsession with coffee really begin? I mean, does it start off as a as a drink that's drunk once in a while, and when does it kind of become like a daily? And is this staple? all part of the Muslim plan? Is <laughs> right. this is this all creeping Sharia? Creeping Sharia. This, this, this has been a three hundred and thirty two year plan for keeping Sharia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, we're patient. You there is different. That. Um, so right. one point was went through Mocha. You know that. Um, okay. That Europe had access to coffee. The other port was uh, in 1683, the Ottoman Turks uh, besieged Vienna. 
and that was the furthest westward expansion of the Muslim Empire to That's Europe. Right. And there was a man by the name of France. He was able to hit knew uh, some Turkish and some Arabic, dress up as a Turk soldier, and he was able to cross enemy lines and brought back information that helped repel back the Turks uh, slightly. And they left behind sacks of they called them strange beans. At first, they thought they were camel food. But Tra France, he had lived in Istanbul for about 10 years, so he knew what they were. They were coffee beans that came from Mocha, from Yemen. So they gave him, uh, the, 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 the Viennese, the government, the king was so happy with what had, how he had helped them. They gave him uh, the beans and he, was, he opened the first coffee house in Europe. Well, one of the first is a dispute uh, called the Blue Bottle. Mm. And that's where the name of the Blue Bottle Coffee, I'm sure some of you have heard of, comes from. It's on their website also. Ah. And... Uh, and so that's another so, way coffee came real from. Real quick, just for the sake of our listeners, I mean, is, is Blue Bottle a nationally known chain? It's an internationally known chain, actually. Oh, it is, okay. It's, it's, but uh, here in the Bay Area, I mean, arguably considered one of the best places yeah, to have they coffee. They were one of the first to start this, you know, going back to the roots of coffee and yeah. put in the, the date of the roast on the packaging, and, and they cared a lot about traceability. So I'll go back after I answer your question Sorry, yeah. mm -hmm. into specialty coffee and what that is, because, right. you know, they say like only 1% of coffee drinkers know what specialty coffee is. Um, and so, uh, coffee has always been something that that Americans have been interested in from okay. early on. It was something that was taxed, you know, it was one of the reasons why, you know... Uh, you always hear about the Boston Tea, tea party, party, but maybe there was... Coffee, coffee. was always an <laughs> interesting thing. It wasn't able to be grown. It can only be grown in about 66 countries in the world. 66. It's a very okay. small amount. And North America and Europe cannot grow coffee. Mm. Uh, there's one coffee farm in Santa Barbara that grows coffee very small amount but it does called goodland organics the owner jay is good he's a, a great great uh, person and um and boot coffee i work with them they have a why uh, is that though sorry real quick why, why it, it needs it? a specific kind of microclimate and elevation it uh -huh. can't be grown too low and mm -hmm. but for some reason because i they were able they're able to grow it they have a, a unique microclimate that, that exists in santa barbara that was able that allows to be grown there but usually you need a thousand meters above sea level around there to start uh -huh. growing coffee. Santa Barbara is a gorgeous place. So, but now just, here's uh, yet another reason to visit. No. You definitely should check that, that farm out. I would out. love to, yeah. Um, and, uh, and there's different waves of coffee, like I said. In the 50s and 60s, uh, there'd be this instant coffee vacuum packaging started happening and became, you know, um, Folgers and also you had Hills Brothers had a lot of marketing campaigns and people Maxwell House Maxwell right. House so all of them they had and a lot of them were San Francisco companies really from San Francisco because okay. the part of SF was major part for coffee right and uh, so this vacuum thing the, uh, the vacuum uh, where, where, vacuum you, sealed vacuum sealed sorry when does that, does that is that an American phenomenon yeah the, uh, okay. the Hills Brothers started that Hills and Brothers I believe coffee. in the early which they're still around right you uh, they, they're kind of around they've been bought out twice and so I don't okay. yeah, technically you still find them I think I online the name is still around the name is still around they still around. kept the name the brand the company is still in the, in the building um, okay and and then after that I mean, it's always then Starbucks played a big role of creating the third space again. Uh, when they, when the founder went to, I think it, Italy, he was, he liked this idea of this place, the coffee house, people can meet. It's not, it's not your house, and it's not your workplace, and he really brought that back. And it's true. People always ask me, what do you think about Starbucks? Right. Starbucks is great. It really brought coffee back into the fold. That is so true. I never they thought have, of that. I think twenty three thousand locations in the world. I think seventeen thousand in the U S. and whether you want to have an interview, go on a date, meet somebody, or stop to use a nice bathroom, people go to Starbucks. Yeah, that's a great meeting, and it, it provided that space. Now, now yeah, it, it, this certainly begins in my, in our lifetime. But when, like the nineteen nineties, when is Starbucks? I'm not sure exactly. Yeah. The first one opened up in uh, Seattle. Right. I'm not sure exactly when, but that's one of the things Probably that brought, it brought to, that the U, time, right? to the think? U.S. Sounds about right. When does it come into your yeah consciousness? I would say about in the nineties. Sure. I don't remember Starbucks existing when I was in high school, for example. You, you don't. I do not. So it would have to be like the mid to late nineties. It is, and yeah. uh, okay, and then especially coffee is a whole other world. The people, it's interesting. A lot of people who are even who love coffee don't understand what what is specialty coffee. It's not. It's it's basically, it's a lot about traceability and going back to the source of coffee. When I go into a specialty coffee shop. And you buy a coffee, they'll tell you this coffee is from Ethiopia, mm. from Yurkachev, from the from the farmer, a farmer named Snakish Thomas, a beautiful farmer. She has an, an incredible farm called Amaragayu. It's located 1,900 meters above sea level. The varietals are heirloom varietals, and it's washed. They really tell you, you know, 
the story behind this coffee, how that's it gets right. to you. That's right. And coffee, I mean, again, these varietals, based on the elevation, the microclimate, the varietal, it produces different tastes. When you buy an apple, you under, there's Granny Smith, and there's Fuji apples, and right. Washington apples. Everything has a price point difference here. So it's like, it's kind of like wine, where you have these terroirs now that are known, and, and they're becoming more and more known now. And some coffees can go up really high in prices. You can buy a cup, I bought a cup one time uh, for $9. This incredible coffee that was from Bolivia that was grown at a 2400 meters above one of the highest grown coffees I had. It was incredible. You can buy coffee right now from Ethiopia from Blue Bottle for 450 a cup. It's something that it's a luxury that you can most people can afford. Right. You know, maybe not every day, but you can. And the great thing about it is that the pe that because we're paying a little bit more for the coffee, it's having an incredible direct impact on people in the world. Farmers now are picking coffee cherries riper, drying them better, processing them better, and taking care of them all the supply chain. And what happens is you're getting an incredible product, but you're also putting food on the table for millions of people. That's right. You know, coffee, the price points of coffee right now is actually con it's contributing to world poverty. People are being exploited to sell their coffees at such a low price. So especially coffee is a way where you don't need, you know, um, artificial NGO money. You don't need any of this fair trade direct trade you give these farmers an incentive and price point for them to give you a better quality of a, of a product and everyone is happy so for the sake of, again of our listeners what is i mean I, I guess we can talk a lot about what is specialty coffee but what is not specialty coffee so for example you go to the grocery store aisle um you know and it's uh what, what, what is it i don't know a folgers or i mean forget the instant varieties even if you buy a bag of a pound of like dunkin donuts coffee bean or ground that's not specialty coffee no i'll uh some of it's subjective and some of it's not right and so so for example look at, i mean i'll just give you an example like, so very recently i went to target and uh i happened to be in the coffee aisle and i found a bag of intelligentsia coffee now that i generally associated with a specialty coffee uh a brewer if you will and but yet so now but now it's found in found in your target you know grocery aisle i'm going to explain to the supply chain okay what it takes for to make coffee specialty so you can determine that wherever you go there you go please um yeah and so to, to, to first look at a pyramid i want you to imagine a big pyramid on top of that pyramid five the top less than 10 percent of that is specialty coffee it's a very small amount of coffee yeah. it's extremely small and compared to the, like the millions and millions of kilos are produced yearly so the difference the difference between specialty and commercial coffee so start at the farm level as i mentioned coffee it takes a while for it to mature when harvest season comes uh, especially coffee pickers what they do is they only pick the ripe red cherries okay. this takes an, an, a lot more effort on the coffee farmer to selectively pick the coffee as opposed to strip picking it or using mechanized machines to just harvest all the colors True. and so that is it's very difficult i mean to to actually look by the cherries and pick only the ripe red cherries yeah instead of going every two weeks to just you know harvest it right. you have to go almost every day two three days to pick these ripe red cherries secondly the way you process it is a huge amount of care and how you process it if you're going to do the natural process of coffee which you let it dry until the mucilage gets dried up you have to have special drying beds or patios and, and you have to move it and you have to use special moisture analyzers to know exactly what level of the moisture it is. If it's over 12%, a fungus can grow in a bacteria and cause oral cancer. All these things, it won't ferment, it won't overmold. If you use a wash process, you're doing it on the same amount of effort in quality control. Then you're separating lots. So based on elevation or varietals, you separate things to keep it unique. You don't mix up all the regions. So one lot, one micro lot cannot be more than 37,500 pounds, you know, of coffee. Mm -hmm. It has to be very specific, a small lot. Then the, when it's pulled up to the huller, the, the mill that mills the coffee, you have special hullers and you have special screen sorters and density sorters and laser sorters by color. And then you even have hand sorters who pick out defects by hand. There are 16 visual defects. And then after that, you have to put them in special packaging, grain pro packaging, and let it rest for two months. And there's a magical thing that happens where coffee curates and it becomes the flavors unify and the fragrance comes out. Then you ship it over. Then after that, you have to take it to a special roaster. And the roasters, they're like alchemists. 
What they do, they use different temperatures, gas and airflow, uh, conductive and, and radiant heats to manipulate the coffee bean as it's being roasted to bring out the best of the coffee's origin. So it's developing its sugars and right. it's developing its acids at a certain point. Okay. If you ever go and see coffee from certain coffee shops and it looks oily and shiny, mm -hmm. it's because the sugars have been roasted out of the coffee and it's boiling its own oils, cooking its own oils, and it tastes burning and disgusting. Mm. And if you go to especially coffee shops, you know it's like a, a more of a medium roast, and it's if you, the beans seem a little more heavier, they seem they're not as smooth as a, as the darker roast ones. Darker the beans are not the beans. Yeah, when it's yeah, when right. it's darker roast, they do that because the especially coffee it's an artisanal artisanal roaster. They they're looking at this and they smell it and they're Right. small batches as opposed to these giant machines they shove it in there and wait 15 minutes and, and take it out right. and um you taste the beans they taste different and uh and so then they they, they serve it within a certain time frame coffee really has you know three days it starts to open up until like a week 10 days after that the flavor goes down yeah. it's not pre-ground and so as so that's especially coffee that's the amount of work and effort it takes hundreds of hands have touched your coffee masters at every level of the supply chain have picked right. that coffee and and dried it correctly and processed it correctly and shipped it and roasted it and packaged it to get to you and then brewed it the the the, the brewer has to have a, a specific ratio of coffee to water a specific kind of grind water temperature and the way it's brewed whether it's a chemix or it's a french press or espresso all of that has been and they're constantly trying to work and improve their craft as opposed to commercial where it's picked willy-nilly with a machine or stripped pick with their hands dried without any protocols sh hulled out any, any shipment you're not separating the varietals or the regions or the elevations it's lumped together it's taken from there and put in regular burlap sacks sometimes have potato taste defects and rubber defects and malic and i mean rubber and all these different tastes that you don't so want to taste about creep in right. creep in it's roasted really dark to hide those defects because it's, it's burned you don't know how it tastes anymore you know then it's just grinded and put into a packet ready to be instantly ma made and you have no idea where this coffee came from how it got to your who brought it what the elevation of varietal and so this is what makes specialty coffee special it's the the, the incredible journey throughout the supply chain it doesn't it's, that's one of the issues we have in america we we don't know where our food comes from we right. just assume that we press a button in Starbucks and the beans come out right. it comes from the earth and That's people true. literally pick that coffee one coffee tree produces one pound of coffee which is about 25 cups could you imagine how many people it took to produce that cup of coffee you're drinking to That's pick right. it it's how much that's quantifying it into, into like a phys an actual number it is it is fascinating um, no I mean and arguably I mean Amer yeah Americans don't know where their food comes from where their clothes come from I and mean, we can go on and on um, but, but real quick, so because you, you, you mentioned uh, about the roasting process, um, I think for most listeners, you know, we know le light, medium, dark roast. Speak a little bit about the roast and what are some of the intrinsic, um, if you will, benefits of one roast over another? So people like different types of coffee. Okay. Some people like really light coffees that bring out floral and fruitiness. Some people like darker coffee. Darker has a little more thicker of a body, sometimes more chocolatey taste. Um, most people when they drink especially coffee like from kenya or ethiopia or Yurichef, it's very light almost like tea like and honey and blueberries in it mm. they think this is too light this is a tea why is it red why is it not black you know we have this nostalgic memory of like drinking like burnt coffee <laughs> we go to diners and the, and the thing about coffee when it stays to rest after you brew it for more than 30 minutes uh this acid called chlorogenic acid forms and from that Two other acids form after that, quinic and caffeic acid. One is sour, one is bitter. Mm. It's very important to learn these uh, organic acids and things that happen in coffee. It's just, uh, and so that's what we, we associate coffee with. And we just fill it with cream and sugar to, to hide the bitterness to it. It tastes like burnt popcorn. The roaster, it's hard to say this coffee is better, medium or light. What, what I do is when I get a coffee, I roast in different methods and different um, there's different milestones for coffee okay. when the first crack happens it's it starts off in uh, endothermic which is building up heat as it builds up heat it's the sugar molecules are forming the caramelization is happening and the, it starts off in four minutes it called the fresh cut grass period it smells and looks like fresh cut grass and then in six minutes it becomes they call it uh, the uh, hay where it looks like yellow and it smells like hay mm. 
and you'll notice that artisanal roasters they'll pull out the coffee on this little trier to smell it and bring it back in you have to look and use your senses and smell then around eight minutes or so is the baked bread the sugar starts to caramelize and form and you can smell like baked bread sweeter baked bread at around 8 30 9 minutes is when you, you want to hit the first crack which it goes from endothermic to exothermic which means now heat is coming out transferring out after that a lot of things are happening and you really have to slow down the temperature and figure out when the how long the roast development should happen some coffees you want it to roast a little darker you know some of them you want it lighter dark some coffees when it's darker it has a better body more better lactic acid taste to it some coffees like the yogurt chef taste wonderful light as possible you know the blueberry t- notes come out of it and the very floral smells come out of it mm. geisha as, as well uh, and so it all depends on the, the roaster and the coffee he has well, how to bring out the best of this coffee's origin now what happens after the first crack after a minute and a half two minutes second crack happens and after that this is a crack in the bean you literally it's like popcorn okay it starts to pop oh. up the, you know, the air, when the air is coming out right. and typically you don't want to hit second crack for freshly coffee second crack after that the beans start to become too dark it starts to hide it's whatever floral and fruitiness it has you do d- dark rolls for coffees with defects commercial coffee you wouldn't want to do that with a nice coffee because you want to bring out the best of it mm-hmm. when it's light it's kind of naked almost you just everything is there you can taste it when it's darker it's hidden and again, you'll notice uh, coffee shops that have like, coffees that just look shiny. The oil, this, it's frying its own sugars, right. and it's really bad. So going uh, something you mentioned earlier, um, you you know you said look the, like the plant from where or the shrub where we get coffee from uh, produces a fruit. It's a fruit bear, you know bearing shrub. That fruit is not the coffee. It's the seed, or the right inside of the fruit. So it's a cherry with two. Or the bean. Typically, it has two beans inside it, two pits, it. and it's pits. five layers. The first layer is the skin, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, and Yemen is interesting. Actually, when the coffee is dried, we actually use the husk, we call the husk, as a uh, tea, a wonderful tea mm. that we make out of it. No one else in the world really does that, um, except for Yemen, I've noticed. And then below the the, the skin of it is the mucilage, it's like kind of sticky honey. Yemen is the only country that does only natural process. I mean, we let the coffee dry, and so the sugars, the honey sticks onto the bean longer, as opposed to the wash method that mo- most people in the world use. It's, it's, it's faster production, it's easier and more, mm-hmm. it's more evened out, but it creates a lot of waste with the water, the excess water to use. Okay. After that, you have the parchment, which is a kind of a jacket around the coffee, and under that, you have the um, silver skin, which is, and then after that, you have the bean. Typically, you have two beans in there, now there's something called the pea berry, which is sometimes a cherry only has one bean in it. It's kind of clumped up together, and uh, and it has a small. Every coffee tree is produced a certain amount. Some coffee varietals produce more pea berries than others, and they usually sell for more money sometimes because it seems like the coffee trees give them more nutrients. It being that one bean by itself. Okay. Uh, oh right. A little Instead more acidity. Yeah. Um, that's the looking at the coffee and it's five different layers. Fascinating. Now, uh, speaking of Yemen, uh, uh, you had mentioned earlier that, uh, well, before uh, off mic, that uh, you had uh, encountered some trouble getting back into the country uh, while you were while you were in Yemen. I think that's that was uh, you, you mentioned it was in April of this year. Yeah, my my story is interesting. Like I uh, I come from this first wave of coffee. My family, where we're from, is literally the oldest place in the world to cultivate coffee. Okay. And I was inclined more, like you have to go into law. I was paralegal. Mm-hmm. And I was a client seeing if I wanted to go to law school. And I said, you know, is this what I want to do with my life? Like many people, we, we get that role in our, in our early in our adulthood or even later where we have something in the back of our heads we're interested in. But it's really hard to bring that up, bring, move that out of the back of your head into the frontal lobe and decide, hey, you know what? I want to do this. It's mm-hmm. kind of crazy, you know, but I was always interested in coffee in Yemen, the history of mocha. My grandparents told me stories about coffee in Yemen and I just wanted to do something that... um you know, to do something to help my family's homeland and something I was passionate about. So, you know, initially I didn't tell my family or friends I had this idea what I wanted to do. But I, uh, I met Willem Boots and he became my consultant, my coffee mentor, and showed me the ropes. And he said it's going to be very fast paced. And I ended up, you know, three months after that in Yemen, and I decided to start on a, a adventure. You will. I wanted to, st- to study the supply chain. So I had these old Arabic books on coffee in Yemen. 
sometimes 50 years old, sometimes 200 years old. Mm -hmm. And I had these United Nations, the USAID reports on coffee production in different provinces. So I went to the city of Mocha and I zigzagged along the, the, you know, the old coffee Mocha route <laughs> to 32 different areas in Yemen to grow coffee. And it was an incredible journey. I got to go and meet people and, and, and places I'd never heard of and people in Yemen don't even know about. We're so isolated. Yes, I would write down the, my reports. I'd write down the elevation, the soil type, the varietal harvest patterns, price points. But more importantly, I got to hear the stories of these farmers. Yeah. And I got to see what their problems were. Unfortunately, this was not the best time to do that. Um, Yemen in 2011 had a revolution and outs the former dictator. And what happened, uh, there was an interim government put in place and there was different factions rivaling for power. It was a big power vacuum. Yeah. And so there was a militia called the Houthis in northeastern Yemen. And they had begun taking over different cities in provinces throughout Yemen. And I, am, I was just very stubborn. I just wanted to continue my journey. And in the process, I went through shootouts and tribal ambushes and drones. That week I arrived, there were 66 in civilians that were killed by U.S. drones. Hmm. There was a French NGO worker that was shot in the head. Right. And there was all these things happening. And, you know, but I continued my journey. I brought back these, I brought back 21 different samples of coffee from Yemen uh, to the U.S. And we began to taste them and score them. And like I said, it's out of 100 points. Anything above 80 points, it's called specialty coffee. Mm -hmm. To quantify specialty coffee, that's oh, how yeah, we, that's yeah. we do it. Right. 85 and up is amazing coffee. 90 plus is extremely rare. Okay. So my goal was to get to like 70 points, you know, and then try to work on raising the coffee up. Nobody had ever brought back single origin coffee from Yemen. It's always been mixed up from different regions. And unfortunately, around 30% of Yemeni coffees, uh, low grade Kenyan Ethiopian coffees that are mixed and named Yemeni coffee, at least 30%. Right. So no one had brought, if you go to Pete's Coffee or even before Starbucks when they offered Yemeni coffee, they would have some in weird, uh, ambiguous name like Arabian Mocha Sanani. You know, you know, they don't grow coffee in Sana'a. Sana'a is the capital of Yemen. Right. And so, ended up uh, bringing these samples. We cupped them, and most of them were pretty bad because of the way they picked incorrectly and dried incorrectly. But two of those coffees were 90 plus. Wow. Making wow. them some of the most expensive and rarest in the world. Right. And so, I decided I'm going to go back and buy more of those coffee samples. Bring And I shipped them, and we, 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 kept, we tasted them again, and, 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 and they were horrible. The same farmers. Right. So I realized that I had to slow down and begin working on the ground a lot slower. Before coffee, I was a community organizer. I mostly around civil rights issues for people of color, Muslims living post 9-11. Post and so I decided that I have, that's what I have to do. I have to power base and work with farmers on the ground. And I went back to Yemen second time and I began a seven month program with this one coffee cooperative in mm -hmm. Northwestern Yemen. and. Um, I started this journey by myself and this cooperative we have, we work with a uh, little over 32,000 farmers now. And we began by building the first drying beds in Yemen. We began by installing the first moisture analyzers. And I, uh, and the process before that I left, I finished the certifications to become a coffee taster. And oddly enough, it was ironic, I became the first Arab, Arab coffee cupper in the world. I, I don't know why it took so long for someone to do it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> And uh, I went back to Yemen. I began to work with my farmers. The, <coughs> the militias had began taking over. They, at that point, they took over the capital. Mm -hmm. And then there was different issues, had factions going on. And uh, This is earlier this, you're talking early 20, 2015. 20, 2015, yeah. Right, right, exactly. And, um, I remember that. And I just kept, I continued my work. And uh, I had organized with the Coffee Quality Institute. Uh, there was the... Uh, this big coffee conference called the this is hosted by the Specialty Coffee Association of America, the SCAA. They have an annual conference with over 100 countries that are, that come between 10 to 15,000 participants. The largest coffee conference in the world. Mm -hmm. So my goal was to do a marketing event in this coffee conference and try to get Yemen coffee back on the map and help my farmers. Yeah. Now organized a coffee event for Yemen in this conference, and so I'm getting things ready to leave. And I remember, like, I was two days away from leaving. On March 25th, I heard I was at my mill. I was working late night, and I woke up to loud explosions. First, I thought there were just some kind of wedding. And I went out, and I saw it looked like laser beams being shot in the sky. And it was anti-aircraft machine gun fire being shot at Saudi rockets, uh, Saudi uh, planes. Saudi Arabia, along with 10 other countries, were had begun a military campaign in Yemen to stop the this militia group from taking over uh, Yemen and the port cities in Yemen. And 
you know, unfortunately, there are bombing like heavily populated cities, like the capital where I was in. Uh, we have over four million people that live in Sanaa, and mm -hmm. they were bombing them, and I was in the middle of it, and so, you know, I was okay. I knew, I need to figure out how to get to this conference. People often often think that I try to just escape the violence. I really want to go attend this conference. That's, <laughs> that's, I'm going back to Yemen in a few weeks, yeah. actually, and then oh, so right. yeah, you mentioned that. I. Uh, I tried to go to a different route in the Gulf of Aden. It didn't work out. Eventually, I heard about, I heard about uh, the port of Mocha, which is the port I named my company after. No one uses that port anymore. It's a very old port. It's mostly Muslims from smuggling. The two major ports of Hodeida and Ada in Yemen were being bombed day and night, and so I couldn't go there. And I heard there was some limited activity from this port. So I took my 80 kilos of coffee and I drove down to the port you know, from the capital, seven and a half hour drive, and I got there, and originally I was supposed to take a larger ship with 200 Somali passengers and tons of onions. <laughs> and we get there, and there's no diesel in the engine, so they said we, we can't leave, and they were, they were, we were at that point, that night, they were, they were gonna get bombed again by the coalition group, and there was already Houthis coming into the city, and so there was some violence happened while we were there. Right. And I remember seeing a small fishing boat, and I said, what about that boat? And I ended up, uh, I went down there with a buddy of mine named Andrew Nicholas from Rayan Coffee. He also works in coffee in Yemen, he does incredible work and... What's and the name of the coffee, Rayan? Rayan Mill. Rayan Mill. And okay. they, they do incredible work in Yemen. So you were there with other Americans? There's t thousands of Americans right, that are in right, Yemen. Right, right. And he, and so I, I know while this was happening, I know here on the ground, I'm sure you, you, you became aware of it or were of it, aware of it as, as, as it was happening, but there was uh, like, Obviously, there was some work trying to get the State Department to do something, to step in, to try to get you and the other Americans who were there out. Oh, I was uh, in communication with the mayor of Richmond, city supervisors in San Francisco, people from different the Council of American Islamic Relations, the okay. Asian Law Caucus, several civil rights organizations, um, and the Center for Constitutional Rights. And the State Department's message to us was, well, I'm sorry, we can't help our citizens right now. What we can do for you is we could relay your messages to your loved ones via our website. Wow. No, and but that I was there. That's converting. And at yeah. the same time, India and Pakistan, Djibouti, Russia and China, they were all evacuating the citizens. At that point, that week, China evacuated 600 citizens. And I knew it got really bad when I woke up one day and saw an article that said, Somalia is evacuating citizens out of Yemen. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, I, like, where's I, America? And I, you know, I was, yeah. it was sad to see that. I knew there was five U.S. warships docked in the Arabian, Arabian Gulf of, of, of Aden and no help for us. And you know, there was a delicate situation. I understand that, but there was a many. There were many ways that we could have figured a way to leave, and so what, you, what we needed was a master negotiator like Donald Trump in office. Oh God! <laughs> and so yeah, he'd figure, I, it I probably, he'd figure it out. He'd figure it out. The deal maker. I'd probably still be there. <laughs> and so I, yeah, I went to the port and I took a small fishing pole. I think right. it was sixteen to eighteen feet. Wow! With a forty, a small forty horsepower Yamaha engine in it which is not a good idea because when you have a single motor engine and if it dies and you're stuck in the middle of the Red Sea with, it's one of the most highly pirated seas in the world. Right. Um, and we right. crossed the Red Sea, we crossed the entire Red Sea on a little fishing boat, got to Djibouti. From there, the governor was just kind of shocked. They, they didn't, they were thought we were smugglers. Mm. We showed them our passports and like, you know, why did you do that? I'm like, we had to leave. From Djibouti, you got to Kenya, from Kenya to Amsterdam. I asked them, I got to SFO airport and the amount of media coverage that was, was just a crazy media frenzy. I remember seeing that. I went on TV to try to put pressure on the US government for on, a, on the BBC and on Democracy Now, and NPR, a different, I mean, NPR, we had 40 million people who watched that, bit, heard that, my bit. I remember the next day walking downtown, people were taking selfies with me. People recognized me from TV. That's I mean, it was, I had never, Uber drivers recognized, I, I remember driving to this, I got to the conference two days later Hearing myself on NPR, on PR, in the Uber. in the car, and the, the Uber driver's like, man, this guy, there's a god protecting him, but he's kind of crazy. And I'm like, yeah, he's pretty nuts. <laughs> and it was me, but he, she didn't yeah. know. And so we, uh, I got to the conference. I held my event there. It w they considered it the most successful, well attended coffee event in the history of that conference. I awesome. think thirty something years. Amazing. Well, after that experience, you really needed some coffee. <laughs> oh, it was, uh, it was incredible. I remember, I, I, I cut my the coffee scored incredibly high. They gave us some of the highest scores in the. Mm. I mean, people were the price points. The people in Japan and Tokyo and all of the world were interested in buying this coffee I had, mm -hmm. and uh, I liked it because I didn't want to sell a sob story. People when they taste coffee, it's objective. You don't know whose coffee is who. And over and over again, every time I, they cup this coffee alongside other coffees, 
they always cupped higher and scored higher and so um i was just very fortunate to have to be able to find to help my company stay economically viable and for people to be able to um to to, to support it one of the the first people interested in co my coffees was blue ball coffee you know the coffee company that really one of the ones that inspired me and the whole history of the name where it comes from and then the <coughs> website that's right so I, it was just ironic that 332 years later i would travel with those same strange beans right. out of that same port of mocha and find a home for my coffee in the same coffee house and hopefully, in, uh, we hope to ship our coffee and mm, be here in the next few months and be people across North America and Japan be able to buy us coffee. So I, I definitely, I, I mean, I know, I know we're running close to time too, and, but I, I, I do really want to, for you to be able to talk about your company. Um, just for my own curiosity, I wanted to circle back real, really, really briefly is, um, you know, we, we talk about sort of the, um, the, the, the the Sufic, if you will, origins of, 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 of coffee within the, you know, within Muslim culture. Um, was there any pushback from, say, jurists who were like, okay, what's this mysterious being and it's, and it's, and it's, uh, you know, uh, effects on the human mind? Uh, are there fatawa about, about coffee that, that, that are worth mentioning? There are uh, actually in, in, in Muslim and, and also in, in Christianity, there was, it was interesting how coffee was viewed by uh, jurists. So right. initially, because of the name coffee means wine, it was banned yes. by uh, by Muslim scholars. Azhar has many fatwas against coffee. And it, there's two books I would recommend to read. One of them is, uh, uh, one of the, the one I really would like to read is called um, uh, Merchant Houses of Mocha by Nancy Um. And it seems like the, the jurists that drank the coffee legalized it. <laughs> yeah, they said, okay, this is not, this is not, you know, it makes you, it's right. not hallucinogen, it's not a wine, this right. is actually not, you know, people have the time, and especially with some um, um, religious groups, anything that's new is kind of like, it's like unknown thing. It's, that's right. That's and right. it says, we don't know what this is, and it's called wine, why right. can't, we can't drink it. Right. There were some that just didn't like the idea of people being, a lot of political elites getting together and drinking something to make them conscious and talk about social issues. Yeah. They just didn't like that. Uh, that was more so in Europe than in the Muslim world. The, I believe it was Pope, Pope Clementine V. Somehow, sometime in the 15th century, he actually banned coffee. He called an evil Mohammedan drink. Hmm. Then wow. they gave him some, and he drank it. And not only did he love it, but he baptized the beans. <laughs> it's on like, Google. It's, it's, I was hoping he'd say, and then he became Muslim. But, <laughs> and uh, Close, I guess. Uh, it was also uh, interesting in it's England, in London, mm -hmm. on this, the, usually in coffee houses, they had brothels. And so... When the men would go home, they wouldn't want to have any relations with their women. They used coffee as an excuse and said it made it impotent. And they was like, I, I, I just had some coffee. And so there's actually a manifest or petition by the woman of London, you can Google it, against coffee. <laughs> they, had, they, they called it something that they said, uh, <coughs> to quote it, made our men fruitless like the barren deserts it came from. And uh, it's, it's some hilarious bits of yeah, coffee information that right. you read about it's how coffee um, came about. But uh, again, yeah, there was it was viewed as a, uh, something uh, initially. Uh, yeah. so it was promoted by Sufi monks, right? Um, and they loved the coffee. And there was uh, uh, the word coffee. It's funny. Like when I came back to Fremont, I talked to one of my teachers, Osama Cannon. I told him about my journeys, and he's like, "Well, you know, I, I have a book, and it talks about coffee in Yemen. There's actually an, an area in Yemen called Udain, and the name Udain means two twigs in Arabic, and it talks about, and that's where coffee comes from. I'm like, my family's from Ibb, that's where Udain is, and I'm like, Osama, you could have saved me a lot of trouble <laughs> and risking my life. I just came to Fremont and spoke to you. <laughs> it's funny, you've gotten that. Book. And uh, it's funny, yeah. and I went back to Udain. I asked the scholars there. They said, yes, Udain." It means two twigs, the twigs of qat, chat, and coffee that came from Habasha, from Ethiopia. Wow. So it reinforced the idea of coffee right. coming from Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Wow. And when I went to Ethiopia, I actually met families of names of Yemenis from these areas in Yemen, right. which really just brought all back together. And like, yeah. you know, at one point, Harar, and Yemen and Ethiopia didn't have a border. It was just so, it was similar like the, uh, the Aksumai Empire right. from Ethiopia ruled deep into Yemen. That's right. They had a cathedral in Sana'a. And the Queen of Sheba, Ruled, ruled deep into Ethiopia. She had many shrines there, and and so it's just a lot of. Uh, it was like a one. It was it was a considered one country almost. That's right. Very true. Very true. So well, talk I mean, a little bit about just really quick uh, about about your company, what you're presently involved with right now. I know it's, it's Mocha Mill, right? 
our, our company's vision was just to to try to to change the economy of Yemen through specialty coffee. We wanted to empower Yemeni coffee uh, farmers with the knowledge and tools to bring about and change the quality of their coffees and lives. And we want to re-educate the world about coffee. We want Yemen to teach the world again what coffee is and how it comes to be. And and the second thing was just to also to understand how direct trade impacts the world. And it's an incredible way for social impact right. that you're paying a little bit more, but you're helping people directly. Um, I myself, I always see, saw my company as a bridge yeah. between these two worlds. These incredible farmers with incredible stories and amazing coffees. And these people like us in the West who want these farm stories and want these coffee and will pay a little bit more for it. And I didn't want us to interact and intersect anymore through drones and through war. Hmm. I wanted yeah. us to intersect through something that we all knew and love and that was coffee. Beautiful. And uh, I feel really happy to be able to be that bridge. And, um, you know, I, I, I am what helps me a lot being Yemeni and being American. I can put my Yemeni hat on, or in my case, my turban, and just <laughs> go through my villages. I'm not gonna go there wearing yellow socks and you know um, fancy shoes. Oh, you're very sharp. When person. I when I go to Yemen, I'm I'm really tribaled out. Yeah. Some people called me like the, the Indiana Jones of coffee. Some of the funny the funny names I've got called about my work, and you know it's it's not that. easy doing the work I do. It's difficult, but um, you know having people be able to taste these coffees That's and right. to help the farmers, and so I hope to expand to to uh to work in different different areas in yemen um and uh, i'm just excited to be able to share these coffees and to show stories of the farmers who they are absolutely the coffee that I have right now from two regions one in ib central yemen where coffee comes from mm -hmm. and one from the haima province uh, district of Sana'a. and the haima one which is a really interesting one it's one of the highest grown coffees in the world in yemen particularly between 2100 to 2400 meters above sea level and the farmer and the cooperative there, the Ruwad Cooperative, incredible cooperative. 75% of farmers in Yemen that I work with are women. And so one of my requirements is I have that half of the board members have to be women. And they do an incredible work and job with their coffees. Um, so I, I look forward to in a few months from having my coffees here on shelves in the US and Japan and Paris. And uh, my, my another you know message to any viewers out there, whatever you want to do in life, Whatever passion you had as a young child or something in the back of your head, you know, there are so many obstacles in life and, and to that journey. And I shouldn't be alive right now talking to you, let alone have my coffees be put around the world. But if you have a if you have something you want to do in life, make a timetable, focus on it, surround yourself by the good teachers and do it because, you know, you know, it's very important to have to be fulfilled with a legacy, That's right. you know, and to do something you want to do. I did this for two years with no money. And I, I was happy then. I'm happy, happy now. So whatever you have in life that you want to do, go for it. Uh, Jim Carrey said that, and I'll end with this. He said uh, something that he said, my father uh, was a good comedian, but he never thought that he, he can actually do that for a yeah. living. And so he decided to go the safe route and be an accountant. And eventually he was fired. So he, Jim Carrey says, you can fail at doing something you don't want to do, or you, can, you might as well try to do something you love to do and see if you fail or succeed. Right. Well, I think that's a perfect way to, to wrap really things is. up. And, and we wish you the best, not only in terms of uh, your upcoming travels. I know that was one of the reasons why I wanted to book you before you left overseas, uh, because I know you're going to be gone for a little bit of a stint. Uh, safe travels um, while you're out there. Uh, I mean, this is fascinating. I mean, we could, I think we could do yeah, this for absolutely. hours. So The uh, Coffee Chronicles. <laughs> that's right. We could have oh. like a... It's an AMC do, miniseries. <laughs> yeah. Miniseries of, of uh, diffuse congruence. We'd love to have you back, Mothar. Uh, hopefully, God willing, we'll have you back when your uh, when your coffee starts hitting some of the some of the uh, shelves, as it were. There's a couple of in pretty interesting things that are going to happen in the next six months. There you go. Some great surprises. So your viewers will hear about them soon. And no, no, absolutely. And we'd love to have you back to talk you about could, that. You could write a book about. <laughs> all By the way, I just want to say I want to I want to suggest this now. Your eventual memoir, you should call it "Been There, Done That." <laughs> That's a great idea. Thank you. That's a, it's a, there you go. I'm just putting it out there. It's on record. <laughs> it's on record. It's Zucky's idea. I have a little piece of that. See how far my story goes, but I've, you know how many people have asked me to write a book, yes. and uh, you know the ridiculous names. But let me see how far my journey takes me. You know, and uh, and from then we'll see how that works. But thank you guys yeah, so much for having me today. It's been a pleasure being with you guys. No, it, it has been. Where can people find you? Your website, where they can learn more about you, your trade, your your business. You can go on our website at mocha mill, that's M O C H A M I L L dot com, 
and visit, be on our Facebook page and follow our updates then. Okay. Um, and uh, you personally or Mocha Mill has a Twitter. Or... We we have a Twitter and Instagram okay. and Facebook. So as soon as you get on our website, you'll find that stuff. Just Google Mocha Mill. Mm -hmm. If you Google my name, I don't recommend too much. A lot of interesting articles pop up. A man who skips Armageddon in Yemen. <laughs> the story of one man's journey to save Yemeni Khan. Then like random <laughs> things come up. I, I, just, right. I don't Google my name anymore, especially my pictures. I had some. I have one picture. I, they call it the getaway selfie. When I was when I was leaving out of Mok on the boat, I took a picture of my selfie with me I and the driver. <laughs> you should see what people say about that picture. Um, there was a whole fake monologue. One one person said, Mokhtar. And NPR is asking me. <laughs> Mokhtar, do you have any pictures or photos to go in conjunction with your story of heroin escape? Mm. And then it has me. It's a fake dialogue. Uh, monologue. Uh, uh, Mokhtar, he says, yes, well, I have one airstrike photo, one civilian casualty, and 500 getaway selfies. And this, in this selfie, I am, uh, I'm jamming to Freebird. That's what makes it so iconic. Jamming to Freebird? You, yeah, so just... <laughs> they funny. have to add that little Hollywood narrative, don't they? That's yeah, right. yeah. But uh, again, yeah, thank you yeah. so much for joining us. And uh, as far as uh, our show goes, uh, uh, we'll be back in just a couple weeks uh, with our next episode. You can, until then, you can please email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Find us on Facebook. Facebook.com slash diffusecongruence. And, uh, Check us out on iTunes. Write us a review. Go to Stitcher Radio. Mark us up. Uh, show some love. And uh, with that, on behalf of Pervez Ahmed, uh, my name is Zaki Hassan. This is Diffuse Congruence. Thank you for listening.